Colossians chapter 1. Now we started last week, we were looking at this matter of how wonderful the gospel is. And we were talking about the importance of hearing the gospel. But today we're going to talk about not only hearing the gospel, but what do we do with the gospel that we hear. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 1 of the book of Colossians, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. Now again, Paul says he's was establishing his authority here. He says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, not because he decided he wanted to be, not because someone else told him he should be. He said he is the, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So he was called by God. So he sends the message in verse 2. And who's the message to? To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, <coughs> since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word this morning, I pray you'll speak to our hearts. I pray you'll help us to understand the importance of not only hearing the gospel, but Lord, what we need to be doing with the gospel in our own lives. What a wonderful thing the gospel is. For without the gospel, none of us would be here this morning. So thank you for the good news. Thank you for your son Jesus. And may he be lifted up. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now again, as last week we were talking about the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how wonderful that good news is that was brought not only to the city of Colossae here as we see in this letter. But that good news was given to each and every one of us at some point in our lives. None of us would probably be here today if someone had not shared that good news, the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why is it such good news? Why is it so wonderful? Well, number one, it brings hope. The Bible tells us in verse 5, it says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, the good news, that message, the gospel, provides hope. But it also bears fruit. He says in verse 6, it bringeth forth fruit. And what is that fruit? Well, love for the brethren, love for each other. It also is strength and wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and peace. Oh, that's one of my favorites, peace. Before the gospel, there was so much turmoil that was in my life. Struggle, you worry, you have all these things that go on. And then somehow you hear this message. You accept and receive the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And suddenly there's peace. You're able to sleep at night without worrying and being woken up with all these stresses and all these things going on. Now I know there's still a lot of Christians that worry. A lot of people deal with worry. But I'm not a worry warrior. I'll just be honest with you. I'm, I'm not one of those people that, that tends to worry. Now, I have concerns about things, but I don't sit there and just, oh, no, what's going to happen? The sky going to fall, blah, blah, blah. Why? Because I have the peace of God. Now, understand, I come from a family of warriors. My mom worried about everything. And it, it gets inherited. So if apart from Jesus, 
There's a lot of things that would probably worry me too. Upcoming elections, the economy, and you know, just day-to-day -day living. It's fraught with so many worries. But I know who is in control. I know who is in charge. Jesus. And that brings me peace. Why? Because I've accepted Jesus because I heard the gospel. So we have this fruit. But it's also a message of grace. It's a message of truth. What a tremendous message the gospel is. The good news. But how good is the news, the message, if no one hears it? You think about it. You could have the best message in the world. But if no one ever hears it, it never gets spread. What good is that message? It's not very effective, is it? That's why it's so important that we share the gospel. Because it's a life-changing message. As we said last week, the Colossians heard the gospel. How do we know it exists? Since we heard of your faith, people have been told of because of they had heard the gospel. And Paul goes on to write, and he says, you have received this fruit because you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, verse number five. They heard the gospel. And what was the gospel that they heard? It was a gospel that was centered in Jesus Christ. Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus always will be the center of the gospel. Jesus came as a sacrifice for you and I. Because why? We are sinners. Every single one of us is a sinner. No one here is perfect and without sin. And because of that sin, there are consequences. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus came to be a propitiation for our sin. To be our redeemer. To reconcile us to God through his sinless life of perfection. That he was able to be a sacrifice. And the work he did on the cross satisfied our sin debt. He was buried. He rose again after the third day. And that is the center of the gospel. If we put our faith in that, we can have eternal life. So the gospel is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it needs to be spread. People need to hear that. We have a duty and responsibility to share the gospel. But how do we know? How do we know that these people actually had faith. Well, we know that they told they had, they had heard the gospel, but there are certain evidences that we see here in these first eight verses that prove these people had heard and accepted the gospel. And we're going to look at those things today. Number one, as you find in verse four, they believed in Jesus Christ. They believed in the gospel. They put their trust in the gospel. It says, verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. See, Paul said, we have been told about your faith. And what's that faith in? Jesus Christ. Now, it's important that we hear the gospel. But hearing alone is not enough. Now, there were some people who would say, oh, I don't believe that. Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we know that hearing the word of God has the power to bring faith. So we say, okay, <coughs> people hear the word. It's life-changing. But they can't just hear it alone. They have to believe the word. They have to receive the gospel. They accept the gospel. Many people hear the gospel every single day around the world, but not all come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, God's word can 
change people's lives. But a lot of people hear it and it makes no impact on them whatsoever. Because their minds, their hearts are corrupted. And they don't allow God's word to penetrate. How many times do you see people come into the church and they hear the gospel? Maybe they come in once, maybe they come in numerous times. And they were lost when they came in, they heard the gospel, and when they left, they were just as lost as when they came in. How many times do missionaries share the gospel around the world? People preach the gospel. Now, everybody that gets preached to doesn't get saved, do they? And here's one I will give it to you. Have you ever thought about this? Not everyone that Jesus taught got saved. Somehow we don't think about that, do we? But Jesus shared the gospel many, many times, and yet people didn't accept Christ. Wow. And here's the greatest teacher in all the world, the greatest preacher in all the world, the greatest person in all the world, and he was still rejected. People can come in here into this church and they hear the message of the gospel. His death, his burial, his resurrection, paying the price for their sins, giving them an opportunity to be reconciled to God, have eternal life, and they walk out unchanged. They have a head knowledge of the gospel, but there's no heart knowledge of the gospel. Why? Because they did not believe the gospel. Some would say, I find it hard to believe that the way to heaven is by just saying a little prayer and accepting Jesus Christ. They'll say, there's got to be more to it. It's too simple. It's too easy. You've got to work for it. You've got to have this experience or something. You know, you've got to be elevated and levitated around here or something. I don't know. But they're looking for some kind of psychic thing or some boom, lightning and lightning bolts and thunder and all. That's not how it works. And they come in here and they think, they talk about faith, for example. There are a lot of people claim to be people of faith. But what is their faith in? Some people have faith in faith. Now, what does that mean? Well, they have faith in everything but Jesus Christ. They put their faith in church membership. Well, that'll get me to heaven. Well, I was a member of Gospel Light Baptist Church, so I'm going to heaven. Or I was a member of this church or that church, I'm going to heaven. No. Church membership will not get you to heaven. Well, I was baptized. Matter of fact, I was baptized so much. I got baptized you know, three or four times, 15 times, 20, whatever. So I'm definitely going to heaven. No. No, you're not. All you got was a bath. You got wet. And they say, oh, well, look at all the good things I did. I served in the church. I worked in the nursery. I worked in the children's ministry. I was an usher. I was a deacon. I was a preacher. I was a teacher. I did this. I did that. I, well, 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 thank you for your service. But that's not going to get you to heaven. That's not. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh for the Father but by church membership. No. Baptism. No. Working in the church. No. Good work. Giving money to charity. No. Said, but by me. He is the center of the gospel. Not church membership. Not baptism. Not good works. But a lot of people put their faith in faith. Their faith is misdirected. They think religion will get them to, to heaven. Religion is just man working his way to God. And you can work all day long from sun up to sun down and you'll never do enough work. You can say, well, I'm a good person. No, you're not. <clears throat> Guess what? None of you are good. You say, well, Brother Tom, that's me. That's the Bible. Guess what? I'm no good either. <laughs> We're just a bunch of bad people, right? We fall short of the glory of God. The only thing good within us is Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, then you're still bad. You're got good. Try as you might. 
I'm just being honest. That's what the Bible says. So you can have faith in all things, but your faith needs to be in the right place, and that's in Jesus. And you say, well, I read the Bible. I do what the Bible says. I keep the Ten Commandments. Guess what? Faith in the, and keeping a set of rules will not get you to heaven. You can keep all the Ten Commandments. It won't get you to heaven. You say, I don't believe that. Read Matthew chapter 19. Read verses 16 through 23. He had a young man that came to Jesus. And he said, Lord, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. He said, I've done that since my youth. What lack I yet? Jesus said, sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and follow me. And what Jesus said, what you lack is me. And the young man immediately sold everything he had and went, no. You know what he did? It says he departed sorrowfully. He was very sorrowful because he had many possessions. His faith was in his things. His faith was in his good works, keeping the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> now, you can be the most moral person in the world. You can follow the Bible, and you can follow the law. You can do all of those things, but the law is a teacher. And what's it teach you? You need Jesus. And without Jesus, you're going to hell. That's it, plain and simple. You have to believe. Believe. The Bible tells us that in the book of Romans chapter 10, it says that if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we can be saved. He said you've got to confess it with your mouth, but you've got to believe it in your heart. You can hear it, but if you don't believe it, it's no effect. I was talking to my daughter yesterday. We were on the phone. She was asking me some questions about some things. And we got on the subject of salvation and all that. I said, well, you know what? There are some people who have faith in a prayer. The prayer of salvation, right? A sinner's prayer. But there are a lot of people who put their faith in that prayer, not in Jesus, in the prayer. And you say, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, it's like this. I've had people that have come up to me and said, I don't believe in God. But just in case there is a God, I said a prayer when I was little. So I'm safe. I'm going to heaven. They're putting their faith in the prayer that they said, even though they don't believe in God. So how can you have salvation from God that you don't believe in? You're believing in a prayer. You've got to be very careful about that. See, a lot of people will just go, and you'll say, go out there and you'll witness to them, you'll share the gospel, and they'll accept Christ. They'll say that sinner's prayer. Why? Because they're trying to get rid of you. They didn't believe it. They just want you to go away. But they get the impression that because I said the prayer, I'm saved. No. They went through the motions. It was a head knowledge, not a heart knowledge. So it's important that we believe. These people believe. Second thing we would look at, not only did they believe, which was an act of, which involved an act of the mind, understanding the truth of the gospel, their hearts being convicted of their need of salvation and their will confessing with the mouth brings commitment to Jesus and that's what produces the salvation. But not only did they believe, but secondly, in verse 7, we see they were taught about Jesus. It says, also, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. They weren't just told about the gospel and then left on their own devices. Now, that's one of the areas I believe the church misses out on so much. You understand, the Great Commission that we find in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, it says, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. We're supposed to tell everybody about Jesus. We're supposed to tell them about the gospel, the good news. And we have that understanding. We need to be doing that. And if you're not doing it, you should be. 
We all should be. Because see, that commandment wasn't just for the pastor or the preacher or the Sunday school teacher or the deacon. It was for every single believer to get out and share the gospel. Now, we understand that one, and we're, we're okay with that one. But we miss out, because that's not the only part of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is to get the word out. But then it says, and teaching them, therefore, all of all things that I have commanded you. In other words, we get them the gospel, we see they're, sa they're, they're saved, and then we continue to teach them. We disciple. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to disciple young Christians, newborn Christians. Why? Because newborn Christians need to be cared for. Just like a newborn baby needs to be cared for. You don't just have a baby and walk away, do you? No, you can't do that. The baby can't take care of itself, can't protect itself, can't feed itself. It needs to be taught. It's funny because I have uh, chickens. And the chickens, I have baby chickens. Anybody want a chicken? Please, anybody want a chicken? Anyway, I know you want fried chicken, all right? It's Sunday, but anyway. We got these chickens, but the mama will sit there on these eggs. She won't eat for a couple of days or three days. It only gets up every now and then until these eggs hatch. And then once the eggs hatch and the little chicks are there, she doesn't leave them. She continues to stay on the chicks and take care of them. Why? Because they can't be on their own. They'll die. Now, when they get to a certain age, she starts, you get away, go do your own. But here's the thing. We have newborns in the church, in the body of Christ. And you know what we do? We share the gospel. I did my part. I'm good. I shared the gospel. He got saved. I can walk away. My hands are clean. No, you, they are not. You know what? You're responsible for that person. What do you want to believe in me? You need to continue to help them to grow. Just like I do. This church needs to continue to help that person grow. We disciple them. They need to be fed from the word of God. They may not understand the meat of the word. We can't give them deep theology at this point. You can't start talking about amillennialism and premillennialism, postmillennialism, and all that kind of predestination election. They won't be able to comprehend it. You have to give them the basics and get them ground to give them the milk of the word. Show them the importance of reading the Bible and praying. We have to help them to continue to grow. Why? Because not only they need to be fed in order to grow, they need to be protected. If we don't stand up and disciple them and protect them, guess where they're going to go? Down a path of destruction. Because there are predators out there looking for them, namely the Lord, or not the Lord, but Satan. Satan's looking for him. What's the Bible tell us? It says, be sober. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Newborn Christians need to be taken care of. They need to be taught. They need to be able to learn to grow and reproduce. Jesus just spent three and a half years with his disciples. He didn't just call somebody a disciple and walk say, okay, you're on your own now, go preach the gospel. No. He stayed with them for three and a half years and ministered to them and taught them and said, now go teach this to others so that they'll stay on the right path. If we have a, new, a newborn Christian and we just get them saved and we leave them, you know where they're going to get their food? You know where they're going to get their protection? You know where they're going to get their wisdom and knowledge? TV? radio, internet. That's where they're going to go for their spiritual fix. And you know what they're going to look at? They're going to say, the church, this communal worship is not important. They're going to ignore the church and they become what we would call individual Christians. In other words, my Christians, Christianity is all about me and what I want and what I desire. And they get fed, again, this junk food, this spiritual junk food from TV and the internet and radio. Now there's some good stuff out there. Don't get me wrong. Good preachers. 
They have messages out there. But a lot of what they hear is nothing more than junk food. If you leave a child on his own to eat, what are they going to eat most likely? Candy and cookies and things that are sweet. Things that aren't good for them. That will hurt them. Now they may get filled up. But they're not going to be nutritious. So you have this individual Christianity idea where I don't need to go to church. I can get my spiritual fix from watching TV. From going on the internet and seeing some discussion. And maybe not even from the Bible but from some book. You know what that's akin to? That's like us going out and having a steady diet of TV dinners when there's a home-cooked meal waiting for us right here. A home-cooked meal that was prepared with love. The best ingredients. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think necessarily all TV dinners are bad. Sometimes you have to go that way. It's like fast food. Fast food not always bad. But is it the best? No. Sometimes we just need... A home-cooked meal. Well, guess what? Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, I need some home cooking. Because during the rest of the week, sometimes I have to get a lot of fast food. I have to do a TV dinner. Just because of life. But I enjoy coming in here and being fed from the Word of God. That's what's so important. Being surrounded by God's people. (laughs) Helping them to grow. And as they grow, it becomes exciting. And there's proof of their growth. That's the third thing that we see. Proof of their growth in verse, verses 6 and 8. It says, Which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you. Since the day ye heard of it. Saying, you've had fruit since you heard the gospel. The evidence of that fruit is evidence of belief in the gospel. And then we look at verse 8. He said, also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. He said, you're growing because you know what? You love the Lord. And every single day that we spend in the gospel, believing the gospel, growing in the gospel, bearing fruit from the gospel, the more steadfast we should become in our love for the Lord. And when the Lord is doing something great in your life, you know what? (laughs) You can't contain it. You have this unbridled joy. You want to share it. And when you, we as a church are seeing God work in the lives of someone else or someone within the church, you know what? It brings us joy. And it becomes contagious. It's far more contagious than COVID. That joy gets spread and people get excited. Paul's excited. He had never even met these people. He just heard about them. But he knew Epaphras. Because he had ministered to him. And Epaphras is here saying, Paul, you're not going to believe what's going on in Colossae. People are getting saved. They've heard the gospel. They're growing. I'm, I'm preaching to them. And every day I'm seeing change in their lives. It's exciting. Paul's in prison. He probably sitting there going... Oh, great, I'm in prison. This No, he's like, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. He's excited about it. That's the way we ought to be. And it was, he was so excited about it, he couldn't contain it. You know what he had to do? He had to write a letter to the people that he had never met and say, we love you, we're praying for you. You have given us such joy. So that's the way it should work. You remember when you first got saved. You first put your faith, your belief in Jesus Christ. Your life changed. You couldn't wait to tell people, could you? You may not know exactly what to say. But you can say, I got saved. Well, I'm going to heaven. And you were excited. But you know what? That gets tempered over the years, doesn't it? You know why? We don't get as excited about it anymore. It's because it's not new. It's not fresh. And we've just, we've just started taking things for granted. We ought to be excited. We ought to let people know. <clears throat> and see, we had a great love for Jesus. But that love starts to fade as well, doesn't it? Just like in a marriage. You can be with somebody for so long when you're married. You love them. 
But you don't show them how much you love them sometimes, do you? You just take each other for granted. You end up becoming glorified roommates, if you will. You got to work at it. You got to let them know. Now, I'm not always good at this, okay? I fail. But I try to let my wife know I love her. I love her more now than I did when I first married her. You say, why is that? Because I know her better than I did then. And there's some things about her I don't like. Turn, I, I, okay, I hope that went off. <laughs> no, there's some things I don't like. There's things about me she don't like. We find that out. We have habits and quirks. Okay? But there's certain things about her that I love so much. There's certain good things she brings out in me. Well, guess what? The more I learn about Jesus, the more I love him. And there's nothing I find about Jesus that I don't like. He doesn't have quirks. He doesn't have these idiosyncrasies. You know what? He loves me. He helps me. He brings out the best in me. <clears throat> so, my love for him grows the more time I spend with him. You know when I find out that I don't love Jesus as much? When I don't spend as much time with him. That's what I find out. And then I start taking my wife for granted when I don't spend as much time with her. I get busy with other things. You know what? It's not that you don't love them. It's just you just take things for granted. Well, I look at it this way. I don't know how much time I have left with my wife. Today could be my last day. Today could be her last day. But I do know this. I know how much time I have left with Jesus. I got all eternity. And my love for him is at a very small point. But every day throughout eternity, it's going to grow. Isn't that a great thing? That's how wonderful a thing the gospel is. So they had this love of the gospel. The gospel changes us. For one, we have evidence. We saw that they had faith when they heard the gospel because they trusted Jesus. Secondly, they had love for not only Jesus, but they had love for others. Before we hear the gospel, you know what? We seem to love ourselves and nobody else. We're selfish. That love changes us. We love to look, not only grow, again, love Jesus, but we love to grow, or grow to love all saints. And third evidence that they had was they had hope, the confidence that they would derive from the gospel. It gave them strength to face all things, no matter the circumstances. Only hope through the gospel can get us through. All right, would you stand with me? It's not only important to hear the gospel. We have to act upon the gospel. We have to believe it. We have to receive it. Every head bow, every eye closed.